Ich habe das in dem Moment erlebt. I found this in the very moment, this deep feeling of absolute bliss, where you don't need anything, don't want anything. You don't long for anything. No longing, but this deep feeling of peace, of absolute bliss, sweetness. This is sweetness. Love is the sweetness. Miss Michaela M. Zero, you're an artist working with glass, texts, flowers, also with the medium of film. You have, if I summarize it like that, since your father's death a special relationship to the spiritual, invisible world, to non-physical realities. This also includes out-of-body experiences. I would like to start with, let's say, a key experience. What was your relationship with your father like? The relationship with my father was very ambivalent. He was an artistic nature, but very mysterious, very withdrawn. He never revealed any of his emotions. As a child, I always had to feel what happened to him. This feeling into what could be now has trained my sixth sense. I always knew very, very precise what he felt. He never spoke out how he is doing. The deepest pain he has not expressed in a single trifle. He was a carpenter. He wanted to actually be an artist. He then has correspondence courses made for graphics. I've always admired that. My father was technically absolutely virtuoso. When I think about it right now, that's just coming to my mind, the ability to transport oneself through art, this skill has actually developed through this non-talking with my father. In other words, through this failure to reach him. He never said, I'm proud of you. He never said, I love you. That never came. I've always felt a restraint. Also, this deep feeling, there's a love there but he was not able to express it. Only now has it become conciliatory for me. As a child, I missed this lack of lift love extremely. For a girl, for a daughter, is this pride of the father extremely important. The father is the first man in a girl's life. There was such a distance, a painful one. Now, only after the many years since he died, do I feel what it means to communicate non-verbal and thus also build a connection. How did you experience the death of your father? Were you with him? Yes, I was there. He was in a retirement home in Upper Austria and he was already very demented. The retirement home has called and said, one last visit, you don't know. I immediately got into the car because I felt death was near. He has stopped almost eating three months earlier. And in old people's home, they wanted to feed him artificially. So I said, no, if he wants to go, then please let him go. 
During the very last days or weeks, has anything changed in the relationship with your father? He didn't recognize me anymore. He did not know who I was anymore. The interesting thing was how he got into dementia. Looking back on his past life, physical touch, that did not work at all. That's when he became as stiff as a hedgehog. Only a kiss on the cheek did not work at all. For him, it was like, what's happening with me? Please, don't do that. It was only when he became demented that he left to hold his hand. And my hands he often held so tightly that I couldn't get out. Only then was he able to endure physical closeness at all. But what I then observed, when people fall into dementia, it's like an intermediate realm. It's a special realm. It's like a shelter. If the pain is too great in this life, to all the people with dementia that I then noticed in the old people's home, is this not more knowing when the brain is on standby? That's all I can call it. It's like a shelter where it unscrews the fuse. If the pain becomes too great, then people are suddenly in their hearts. Even if they don't recognize you anymore, what opens up, that's that heart connection. All of a sudden, there really is room for that. This closeness he was then able to, and then something flows. That's when I said, okay, I've got it. Now I understand what dementia really is. It's the transition into the spiritual, invisible world. That's when I realized that the physical contact was going on, with hand-holding and so tight that I had to say, You, Dad, I have to take a break now. He held my hand all the way. I thought that was quite an interesting observation. During the actual dying process, you were there too? Yes, when the retirement home called, I felt it before. If close relatives have died, the eagle owl always came and clapped at the window with a roar, where it gave me goosebumps. Since I have said, what is this now? I can still remember that was with my uncle for the first time. With my mother it was the same. So to say, a pre-announcement from the spiritual world, the eagle owl is the bird of death in all mythologies. Before the call there was already the advance notice by the eagle owl. This eagle owl usually flies not in the city center. That's very funny. That was in downtown Vienna. Correct. Or the owl cry. It was both. The bird flew to the glass and then that owl cry. Then I always know, there's someone going now. It's someone says goodbye. I've already had the impulse to go to Upper Austria immediately. I then have packed up, drove, and then before I went to the old people's home, I drove to the linden tree. That was his favorite linden tree in this small village where he was born. From this linden tree in his childhood he always walked down to a mill. From this linden tree that was in June, it has bloomed, I picked a piece of lime blossoms and took a rose. I gave him that laid on his heart and said, Daddy, if you want to go, it's absolutely fine. He just wasn't really there anymore. He then made such a heavy sigh. Then I realized, okay, the soul has now relaxed. I then spent the night in his room. The next day the nurses said I can stay with him. Then I said, but I have to go now because he does not leave until I'm gone. I feel that very clearly. It is very often the case that people only then pass away when the relatives are not there. This is very common. 
Before I left, I said goodbye to him. And you were the best father in my life. That was beautiful and sad at the same time. Then he made such a deep, relaxed sigh. That was release. Without words, he said to me, I actually know that I was never present there for you. But I'm sorry. In that moment I could clearly feel that he said, I'm so sorry that I was not the father for you who you wished for. To feel that was peace. It was pure peace. That's when I felt that there are no limits. They don't exist. Love is the strongest thing, energy field, that we know and have. In this field, we are always connected. Separation is an illusion. We are always connected. We are connected with all people. Even if people let their body behind, we are still interconnected. I do feel my relatives, they are really just present. I can feel the energy of their souls. Death is such a thing, unbelievably conciliatory. If people knew how conciliatory that is, then they would no longer be afraid of death at all. Since it is only beautiful. You then also organized the funeral. For the funeral, I have written a very personal speech. I wanted to read this speech in the church by myself, but I couldn't. The pain was just too overwhelming. I probably wouldn't have brought out a word. The tears would have flowed. That would have been good too, but still, you have to be able to read a speech. The priest has that noticed and took over. Then there was a moment. It was dark. It was a gloomy day. When the priest had finished speaking, a ray of light came in but a glass window. It was like, Daddy is now here and says, it's all good. I'm not the only one who has felt it that way, but also my sister and my daughter said afterwards, there was Daddy respectively Grandpa here, but it was cheerful. That was like, he just tells us a joke, which he liked to do. After the funeral, there was a meal together outside in nature, and then I went picking cornflowers. My father loved them. They were his favorite flowers. Then a cloud appeared in the sky. Then I had the impression, okay, he's sitting on it now, waves and says, everything well, I'm going now. He was gone very quickly as a soul. He was gone really fast. It was so conciliatory, and it was funny. It was really funny too. Later, at some point, you had a very special dream. Yes, then I had a special dream. It was just after the death of my father. Afterwards, I thought to myself, this dream came from the spiritual world. My father sent it to me. Or did my mother send it? Or have both sent it? We don't know for sure. It was at the bottom of the sea and in space at the same time. A dream is able to show that. At the bottom of the sea stood a large Renaissance door and it was closed. Next to the door stood Erasmus of Rotterdam. I didn't know anything about Erasmus of Rotterdam until then, who he was and so on. But in the dream, I knew exactly the name, Erasmus of Rotterdam, beret hat, black Renaissance clothing. The door is closed and he opens the door a crack and says, look out. This feeling of infinite was now increased endless expanses, goosebumps. And then he closes the door and says to me, find the key. During the dream, I still think to myself, 
boy, you don't have all the cups in the cupboard. Which key for what? It's all open anyway. So, riddles, riddles upon riddles. And what about now? At that time, I was in a EU Brussels research project and had been looking at all the glass objects, these relics that fascinate me. And the Ghent altarpiece, of course. The Ghent altarpiece, what a special work. It has such incredible power. I would like to come back to your dream. Would you say it had a special quality compared to other dreams? The interesting thing is, I can remember all my dreams very well. But there are actually dreams that are remembered so intensely, these are soul journeys. These are not dreams in psychological processing of something. This is the journey of the soul. Our soul supposedly travels every night to all sorts of places, to the most remote stars. This outstanding dream has the special quality of a soul journey, a real connection, a message from the spiritual world. And this dream had a special influence on the rest of your life? Yes. This dream was in fact outstanding. This dream has not let go of me. Turning the dream into a film, it was just there. That was not a decision by which I say I'm now deciding something. I'm not doing an artistic project by virtue of my mind. It was never my decision, but it was decided. Did this special dream inspire you to look at the Ghent altar? The dream actually did not inspire me at all. But by the fact that I was working in the EU at that time, I just looked at the Belgian cities, including the Ghent altar piece, which I always wanted to look at. I was magnetically drawn to it. And there I was, standing in front of it for a very long time. And then it was such a touching moment. Then came the message, love is the key, love is the key, what else? There were no walls in the dream, infinite expanse, and the question is always, what does this unlock now? That's love, love unlocks everything, love can also do everything. But by love, I don't mean how we see it romantically transfigured in the Hollywood sense, but more in the understanding that love is a state of being, the highest frequency of divine light. Love is this connection of our divine spark to everything. How did you get the key? Have you experienced this greater, the real love, by yourself? I found this in a very moment, that deep feeling of absolute bliss, where you don't need anything, don't want anything, you don't long for anything. No longing, but this deep feeling of peace, of absolute bliss, sweetness. This is sweetness. That's the sweetness. Love is sweetness. So, in front of the Ghent altar, you experienced this for the first time? That was for the first time. And then I really felt so deep down what love is. Here in the heart dwells the soul. And when you are there in this innermost space, that is this sacred space that everyone has. That's where love lives, where divine dwells. And every person has that. So that was the basic motivation for your film? Exactly. The idea was already there before. After the dream, I thought, okay, what can be the answer? I asked people on film, what could it be? But when the answer came, I said, okay, statements about love. So you come up with the idea of just asking people what love is for them? Yes, exactly. I put the camera in the Vienna woods and said, 
please give me just a statement of love. That doesn't happen in the film at all. But that was extremely important as a precursor to make it crystalline. What intersections, what commonalities have you found in all these statements about love? People have said very different things, singing songs, reciting of poems. But the consistent tenor, if you read between the lines, was this deep feeling of absolute well-being, of being in good hands, of silence, from having arrived, crossing boundaries, going beyond oneself. For many, the experience of death. And over that, coming into the realm of what love is. That was the case with a lot of people. Death experience in the sense that one accompanies a dying person? Or that a very dear person has died. And it was only then that love became experienced. That was a very big overlap. Another major overlap was this feeling of deep security. Find one's own destiny and being close to the soul, to one's own soul. That was actually continuous. Your film deals with the central theme of love. What impulses did you have for the cinematic realization of this topic? This has a lot to do with the pyramid. It has always been like some question from the spiritual world. You're making a film about love? You have a lot of confidence. I think you're overdoing yourself. Do you even know? Do you have any idea what love is? It's such a nice artistic project, but now... You're being tested. That was the hardest test of my life. That was a phase when I was separated from my children for a very long time. It was such a painful experience, where I thought it rips my heart out, literally. I had such a heartache, as if I was being cut alive. I also confronted my greatest fear during this time. And I said, what is my biggest fear? I hardly dared to say it. If my children died, that's the worst thing that could happen to me. This is the worst thing for every mother, certainly the worst thing for any father, but for a mother it's something else, because you carry this child in your body. You have a very special connection. When I confronted myself with this deepest fear, there was suddenly letting go. Then, during this period when I did not see my children physically, I always connected with my children from my heart space to their heart space and have sent them love every day because love is energy. That was a closeness that is not comparable to physical closeness. That's just that energy that we're always connected by, always. Then there was a key experience. At the point of my absolute deepest despair, I sat in the Karlskirche in Vienna. I said, please, dear God, help me. I can't stand this life anymore. Let me die. I can't anymore and I don't want anymore. The tears curled down my face. I didn't see anything anymore. Suddenly, a Madonna on the left. There's a Madonna who is particularly beautiful. She's triangular with two points on the earth and aligned upwards in a tip. And on her arm sits the Christ child. That's just the way it is. It sits there. Then I had to laugh so much because I thought to myself, wow, a mother is a mother. 
always whether the child is there or not. This primordial feminine is a state of being. That was so comforting. Then this heartache was gone. And I was out of my body. Sack. I was able to look down on myself. That was peace. But I didn't die. Although I really wanted to. It was several months where I couldn't find my way into my body anymore. I had a spinning vertigo. I've walked in circles. My soul was outside so that the body could recover, that this physical heart could calm down again. That's how I explain it to myself now. But I couldn't do anything during that time. Regarding your painful phase in life, you told me in the run-up to this interview that you had gone through hell. It was about private matters that were almost unbearable. These were private things that were hard to bear. These were simply private upheavals, which were very, very painful. In this context, with these private upheavals that I have not been able to influence, in the course of this I have experienced this separation from my children over long distances. You have to deal with that. In that context, the question arose intensely for me. It is like an exam. What is love really? In the course of this very painful phase of life, it was only then that I really understood what love actually is. Actually, to be able to connect again and again with a field through which we are in touch with the people we miss, who are not there, who are either physically not there or who have died, to enter this field because that's where we're connected. It is only through this deep experience of pain and this deep experience of separation I have come close to what love really is. Because love is not a feeling. Love is a state of being. This shelter of love saved my life. This also brought me back into my body. We all know that when the pain is so great, whether it's a physical pain, which I have also experienced, or a mental pain that is so great that you think you can hardly cope with it, then it is a tendency of man to say, I want to die now, I can't do it anymore, I can't take this burden anymore. But there was always the message from the spiritual world, but you can't go now. That is not possible now. Because what you have experienced now, you have to communicate to people. This is the message from the spiritual world to people. That's your job. It's something altruistic to overcome one's own selfishness. To say, I can't do it anymore. Now I'm just going. It seems to be the easiest way, but in the end it is not. But overcoming the ego, saying it's not about your personal needs, it's about crossing boundaries, growing beyond yourself, and what you experience has to be incorporated. I'm an artist. My language is art. Another person does it with something else. It doesn't matter either, but to find a way to convey this message. And for this, your film played an important role. A very important role, yes. Did thoughts of your father continue to accompany you during this time? 
Was your relationship with him still an issue? Yes. I resented my father for a very long time, for always abandoning me for a lifetime, and actually also through his death. But then there was a moment in this depth of this pain, In relation to my own children, I then understood my father. After all, you always understand life backwards. Then I understood, first of all, what it means to be a parent. And then also to see the parents as human beings. The moment I saw him as a human being, but also my mother, when I saw them both as human beings, as standing in a situation and not being able to do otherwise. They did the best for us children anyway, but they couldn't help it. They have their own history of development, their own history of learning, of coping with their own things that were actually unmanageable, especially for the generation that experienced the war. That's a burden to carry we can't even imagine where it turns off all feelings, where you actually have to turn off your feelings, to be able to survive at all. That was the war generation. But then I understood. I felt that so deeply. He couldn't help it. I was able to see him as a human being, not as my father, but as a human being. As a human being in his despairs, in his hardships, in his fears, simply because I was able to experience this in relation to my children. That was so conciliatory. Since then, I have also had this deep reconciliation with my parents, with both. For a woman, it is even more important with the father. For my feelings, Only then is there the possibility to come into one's own power. I now feel that I fully have the protection of my ancestors. They're behind me now, and not just my parents, but it goes back many generations. They're here now. But first of all, reconciliation in the heart is needed. Reconciliation cannot be imagined. This feeling deep inside the heart. That's what it's all about. You can't create it artificially. You can't create it with any technology. It's like the ripeness of a fruit. When it's ripe, the time has come. As long as there is a little grudge in the heart. Against whoever. It can be against partners, it can be against parents, it can be against friends. As long as there is this grudge in the heart, you have to look at the resentment. If you can dissolve this resentment by seeing man in his conditionality, in his limitations, then there is love again. Because love understands everything. So, completing the film was for you the fulfillment of an assignment that your dream gave you at the time. Is that a correct summary? Yes. Since the film is finished, I am very relieved. I didn't make the film for myself. It's really this message that love can heal everything. Love can heal the pain, the deepest pain because we are connected to the Divine in this field of love. And we are all lifted up in the Divine. It's all about this deep trust that it's like that. That's what I was able to experience. In retrospect, I have to say, the more pain you experience in life, the greater the learning effect can be. Learning does not necessarily have to be linked to pain. But I can only say of my situation that this experience of deepest pain is always a signal from the soul. 
you have to change something. Look, look closely, look where it really hurts. Then you can take a different path. And also the certainty that in these times of absolute blackness, this abyss, this cruelty which you then experience, you are basically carried through. That's so. You really wouldn't survive alone. Being carried through has given me this deep sense of trust. You can actually relax at any time. If you listen to the signals of the soul, she knocks several times. At first, she knocks lightly. And there are small, subtle discrepancies. And then she knocks again and you don't feel well anymore. And then she knocks again and you're really in disaster. And only then does it happen that you say, okay, thank you, I got it, I have understood what life is really about. It's always about love. I think this was the perfect conclusion. Thank you very much for the interview.